back in person again. Hooray. Hooray for technology. Things seem to be working as well as they did before, but I don't want to jinx it, of course. Let me get the screen share going so that the Zoomers can be with me. That will always be helpful. All right. So how's everybody doing? Good. Hanging in there? Getting yeah. your Halloween costumes ready? <laughs> no? Maybe? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'm going as a tired parent. That's, that's going to be my Halloween costume. It's been my Halloween costume for the last seven years, give or take. But, uh, yeah. Speaking of Halloween, um, you have an assignment that I just put up uh, last weekend that is due on Halloween, but I hope that you get it finished ahead of time so that you can either go party or eat all of the candy and turn the lights off, you know, whichever way you're going to play that. That is, that is a thing, by the way. You know, you can just turn your lights off and not share the candy that you bought, if, if that's your choice. Or you can just leave it on the porch if you don't want to answer the door. But anywho, we have uh, that, let's see, that folks should be working on. So that's due next Monday. We have formative assessment number four here. And I will let you know once the next thing is available that you have to work on. It'll be not until next week. But shall we start maybe with this formative assessment number four? Sound good? That work for everybody? Cool. I looked at these this morning and surviving in the chat. Yeah, agreed. I, I, I hear that. I hear that. That's that point in the semester where I've already started counting, counting down how much longer we have to go. But we are making it work. So this, uh, by the way, went pretty well. Um, wanted to go over the, the answers as per my usual. And I did update grades. So everything that you have done should be reflected in the homework portal. If I'm missing something that you've done, please let me know. Uh, first question, we have, uh, what's the difference between the marginal model predicted V matrix of variances and covariances once you add a random slope related to change over time versus without it? So a lot of good answers here. What does this make you think of? What did you write down? My answer was on the G matrix. But I was thinking that the V matrix is from the G and R. That's right. So thinking that how it combines the two to form the V matrix is where the difference will come from. Yes. If it includes just the random intercept, then the combination it just includes the random intercept with the G and the R matrix. While if you have the random intercept and, and, and the slope, mm -hmm. the G matrix we have the random intercept and the random slope, and those will be combined to the R matrix to form the V matrix. Yes, so uh, paraphrasing a, a long yes correct answer, uh, the, the difference in the how V is constructed is in the G matrix, that is true. So the contents of the level two G matrix would have only a random intercept or a random intercept plus a random slope related to change over time and the covariance between the intercept and the slope. And that difference in G then changes what V looks like when it's put back together again with R, and G is also multiplied by Z, which is the matrix that holds people's individual time values. So when we add the component of random change over time, what does V look like if there is a random slope versus only a random intercept? It's heterogeneous. Heterogeneous, that's the key word. So if there's only a random intercept, then there is constant predicted variance over time, constant predicted covariance due to G. Once we add in the random slope in G and multiply that random slope by the time values that people have, then it's heterogeneous variance as a function of those occasions and heterogeneous covariance as a function of those occasions. So then we have, it depends on the type of random slope, what the pattern of heterogeneity is. So a few of you commented on that as well. So if I have a random linear time slope, how does the variance change over time according to that? Quadratic, parabola, U-shape. If, if I add to that random linear time slope a random quadratic slope, then how does the variance change over time? Cubic. One more up, past cubic. Oh, uh, quartic. Yeah, quartic, the word I had to make up. Yeah, time to the fourth power. The, the point of the story is that once you have some kind of random slope in the model, then there is a new pattern of heterogeneity, but it's dictated by what type of random slope you have. 
It's still a pattern. It's still a smooth, continuous function that predicts how the variance changes over time, and the covariance will change with it. So the, the idea of adding a random slope, really, it's doing two things at the same time. It's allowing people to have a different source of between-person variation beyond just the intercept. So the idea that people differ in at least two ways once you add a random slope to the model. And behind the scenes, it's creating a prediction for what the variance and covariance looks like over time that's supposed to be a better match to the data. Because if people change differently, they, they spread apart. So the variance has to increase or decrease as a function of differential change. If everybody changes the same, if all you need is a random intercept, then the variances may not change either because it's parallel, chain, parallel lines at that point. So those were the big items I wanted in there. Anything else that you thought of or want to ask about related to change over time? All we have so far in our toolbox, by the way, are random linear time slopes and random quadratic time slopes. Starting today, we pick up some new choices. But the same big picture holds, once you add a random slope of a predictor variable, then the model says that the variability is heterogeneous as a function of that predictor in some kind of pattern based on how you've set up the model. There are a bunch of long tables in chapter six in the book where they have the actual equations for how the variance would be constructed based on polynomial models, piecewise models, exponential models, and so forth. All right, any other questions, thoughts on that one? All right, then the next two are getting you ready to do not just this next homework, but also the one after that, the idea of how does the model predict what the expected outcome is at any occasion besides time zero, and if you have quadratic change in the model, how does it predict what the linear rate of change would be at any occasion? So this mostly went well, although there were a few uh, just a couple issues of concern in terms of confusion as to how the statements work that go with it. So I think everybody had the right idea with respect to using the equation to create a predicted value. So if the fixed intercept is 10, the fixed linear slope coefficient is 3, and the fixed quadratic slope coefficient is 0.5, then if I fill in time equals 4, that's 10 times 3 times 4. I can actually start doing it, can't I? That would be helpful, instead of doing it in my head. 4 plus 0.5 times 4, nope, dollar sign, times 4. And I believe that works out to be 30, if my math is correct. So we are keeping the coefficients that are in the equation and substituting in what value of time you want the predicted outcome to be. So if it's time equals four, then that's what we fill in. So in this case, we end up squaring the four because it's time squared that we need to complete in order to fill, to create a predicted outcome. Okay. Now the statements. So for instance, I'll do R because that is the one that is least transparent. The part that goes inside the parentheses, right? Yeah. This is why I don't type in front of y'all. I can't do it. <laughs> there we go. Two blanks. No, that's three blanks, right? So what goes in the blanks is not the coefficients from the model. So I had a few people do this. The purpose of filling in the blanks is to fill in the multipliers of the coefficients. It knows what the coefficients are going to be, and it stores them internally. So to complete this piece of what the coefficients would be inside the R contest 1D function, or alternatively, if you're using SAS or STATA, the values that go after the parameter of interest, Another way of thinking about the same equation would be to do this because the 1 is the multiplier that introduces the 10 into the prediction. So that would go 1 there. What goes in the second blank is the value of time that you want the prediction for. In this case, 
literally four. What goes in the third link is the value of times squared that you want the prediction for, so that would be the 16. So what goes in the blinks are the variables that you need to generate the prediction for. It knows the coefficients and it multiplies the variables times the coefficients as stored in memory. So what makes this nice is that you don't have to know the answers to generate a prediction. You can say, I would like the predicted outcome at times 3, 4, and 5, fill in the values of time that you want the predictions for, and regardless of what the model parameters are, it will generate the correct predictions. Okay. Questions on that? So then the next one is similar. But now the question is, how do I create a predicted instantaneous linear time slope? So what is being predicted is not the intercept. So that means that I don't need the intercept to go into the prediction. I do need at least one of the linear time slopes And I need the quadratic. And what do I got to do to it? Two. Yeah, I got to multiply either time or the quadratic times 2. So in this case, if it's for time 4, then it becomes 8. So the slope would end up being 7, according to this model. There we go. So what would go into the parentheses then? Zero would go into the first spot because we don't need the intercept to be multiplied by anything because we don't need it. A one would go into the second spot because we need at least one of the linear time slope coefficients. And then two times the value of time that you want the slope for goes in the third spot. So that will give us then these numbers multiplied by the coefficients in the equation will generate the, right, the correct prediction and its standard error. Now what if I am not sure if I have this right in real life? Can you think of a way that I can check? Plot. Plot? That, that'd be one way. How about a way that involves verifying the coefficient and not just the, the, the implication of the coefficient? Can you think of a way that I could get the same result without having to write a separate command for it? Or I could check my work, essentially. I'll give you a hint. This is how I originally learned how to do this before I learned what an estimate statement was. How could I get the predicted linear slope at a different occasion? Could you plug in uh, another, like a session, like a, another time value? Uh, very close. Plug in another time value. Heading in the right direction. Uh, take the derivative of the fixed effect solution at the occasion. Uh, that could work if I knew how to do that. But I didn't know how to do that either. I have a simpler solution, and this is one that I still use to this day to make sure that my math is right. So this model equation tells us which linear slope directly as a parameter. At time, At time zero, right? Center time differently. Center time differently. Move where zero is. If I make time four equal to zero and I re-estimate the model, then this 3 should turn into a 7 if I've done my math right. Does that make sense? So anytime you want to check a prediction or a simple slope for a different reference value, yep, Zoomers have it too, recenter at that different reference value. And then the model parameters should be directly what you were trying to estimate if you got it right. And yes, 
I still do that from time to time just to make sure that I've gotten everything correct. It feels really good, by the way, when the numbers match. Do you center it so that uh, time is zero? Multiplied by zero, or like the coefficient multiplied by zero? So, like, let's say that we were dealing with um, the data where I had six sessions. Mm -hmm. So session one to six is my marker of occasion. It's up to me what time zero means. So in the examples we had done with polynomial models, I had made time zero the first session by creating a new predictor of time equals session minus one. If I wanted to check my map and see what the model would predict at session four, then I change the creation of the time variable to session minus four instead of session minus one. And then time zero is at session four. And so then the intercept should be what it would have been at session four. The linear slope would be what it would have been at session four. And what about quadratic? Should it change? If I recenter time, should it change? Not in this model. It's the highest order term, so it's independent. Think of it this way. There's nothing else in the equation that contains time squared. So this is the only source of slope for time squared. It's unconditional. If we had time to the third power, then the quadratic slope would also be at time zero, wherever we had put that. So that is how I learned how to do simple slopes and predictions back in the day. Change the centering point, re-estimate the model, change the centering point, re-estimate the model. And I once had a participant at a workshop come up to me at the break and say that they had to do that 90 times for something because they wanted simple slopes across a range of 90 values of the moderator. And she was just like, oh my goodness, I could have used this. So yes, and bonus points if you can figure out how to write a loop so that you don't even have to write it out 90 times. Right? That should be relatively straightforward to do. Could you use the uh, GLHT function? Uh, one would think, and I believe GLHT worked with the NLME package, but not the LME4 package, which is why I had to switch. Or it did work, but it didn't use the right denominator degrees of freedom, one of the two. But I know within the contest 1D and MD that it, it uses the same Satterthwaite or Kenward Roger denominator degrees of freedom that you've requested, and it seems to get it right. Okay. So, yeah, but the same idea of making the uh, requesting the model to do math on your coefficients to create linear or nonlinear combinations. That's a very useful thing to know how to do across model types. And I wish I had learned that earlier. All right, any questions on that? So you could figure out what the coefficients would have been at time four, but you don't need to. As long as you can ask for a prediction at any other occasion, you can keep the original model in the centering that you have chosen. All right, then I will shut that down. And we have some new stuff to talk about today. New stuff, but also a continuation of old stuff to some extent. Piecewise models. This one. Ready to dive in? So I'm back in lecture six for right now, slide 26 to be specific. So what we had done thus far is look at an analysis of real data, so I don't know what the right answer is, and we had fit polynomial models to describe some kind of nonlinear rate of change and to examine whether or not there were individual differences in that rate of change. Now I want to introduce you to another family of options that still fall under the, lim the linear models framework, meaning they're pretty easy to estimate in most software packages. And they are designed to capture the idea of discontinuous change. So before and after something happens, as an example, these models have a few synonyms that you may have heard. So I call them piecewise models because you're literally taking a continuous slope and breaking it into pieces. Uh, they're also known as linear splines. And this is the same logic that generalized additive models use, except those models are designed to find where the pieces should be broken in addition to what type of piecewise slopes you need. 
So the idea of these models is to be able to capture discontinuous change by dividing your time range into different sections or epochs and then fitting slopes to each discrete section. So this is useful for intervention type designs where there's something different happening during part of the time than the rest of the time and you want to test whether or not people change in their expected intercepts as well as their expected slopes. It's useful for like things like changes in policy. So uh, Vladimir, your talk last Friday about the educational system, this is what I immediately thought of before and after they're changing all of these policies. If you have the historical data, you can look at that. The one thing that I will tell you to use this particular flavor of these models is that they're designed for situations in which you know ahead of time where the breaking point between the time sections should be. So here's an example from a student many years ago who was looking at a multiple baseline intervention design. So she had fifth graders where this was in a real world classroom. So they came in and measured some kind of outcome. It was related something to class participation, if I remember correctly. So this is like the number of times on average kids did something. They introduced some kind of intervention that was designed to increase the outcome, and lo and behold, it looks like it did. So right away, it looks like they went up and they're continuing to increase over time. They took away whatever they had changed, and lo and behold, it drops right back down again. They stopped growing, they reintroduced it, and it goes back up. So this type of trajectory, we've got you know, 27 or so different occasions here, if I were to fit this with a polynomial model, like think about how many times this would turn. So the first part looks like it's quadratic, but then it switches to go back up, so that's at least cubic, and comes back down again, so that's quartic, and then comes back up again, which is quintic, I think, heading up to septic, right? You know something's wrong if you're up to septic. And that wouldn't answer the question. Like, I could fit a fifth or sixth order polynomial because I have enough data, but the researchers don't want to know if the sixth order polynomial contributes to the growth curve. They want to know if their intervention worked. So to directly answer that question, I would ask, you know, are they higher during the treatment phase than the baseline phase? And did that happen again? And do they grow more during the treatment phases than they did during the baseline phases. So if I fit a slope to each of these discrete phases, as well as potentially a shift in intercept, what I refer to as a jump, then I can answer those questions directly. So if you know where the breaks should be, that's the way that we would approach these models. If you don't know where the breaks should be, then you need to search for something called either a latent change point or an unobserved change point, something along those lines, where then part of one of the model parameters is where the slopes break. Yes? But isn't that game exploratory territory? Mm -hmm. So was that, do you have more concerns about <laughs> do, do I hate those models too? Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I tend to, not to dislike exploratory models. I think that the question would be, what kind of inference are you trying to make? So are you trying to just fit a nonlinear trajectory? And it looks like you, know, you have some sort of change that maybe levels off and you're trying to figure out where that should be. And you're willing to just estimate that parameter as a way to describe the trajectory. Then I think it's okay to be like, I don't know where it should be. It looks like it, you know, it bends somewhere in here and I'm gonna figure out where the optimal number is as one of the parameters versus I'm going to make some sort of theoretical conclusion about change stopping at this exact point that only was developed in my one data set as opposed to a consequence of theory or previous research or anything else. So I don't hate it as much, maybe is the short answer. Could you do this in a confirmatory way where you, you just think, oh, well, the breaks should be here and test to see if that's actually what's going on? Yes, yes. So you can, you could treat it as a confirmatory where you could look at the model fit under different spots for the break okay. and see which one fits relatively best. Um, there is a, there's actually a term for that and I'm blanking on it. It starts, 
with a P, penalized likelihood, something along those lines. I remember reading a paper where that's literally what they did was an algorithm that tried like every possible spot and tried to see where the likelihood was the highest and they picked that one as the break. Okay. But yeah, yeah, it's, you're limited only by your creativity and your willingness to work with difficult software, I would say. Um, there have been some recent papers looking at latent change point models and random effects therein using SEM software um, Jeff Herring is one of the, the authors on that. I'm pretty sure I've linked to one of his papers in here, as well as other folks. So if that's something you're interested in, I can help you find the right combination of keywords. But for our purposes in this class, we're working with data where we know where the break should be. Either because we looked at the data and said, it looks like it should be here, or we have some kind of expectation based on the design or the theory driving the process as to where the break should be. So I once had a student get very excited about these models and say, could I look at like change before and after puberty? Could you do that? Mm -hmm. If you have measured adolescence, like before puberty started and afterwards, sure you could. Except to use these models. I need a date in the data set when puberty was for each child. And short of that, then you're going to have to do something to where you would have to figure out based on the data where puberty was. And you'd have to be willing to say that puberty hit at the exact same age for all the children. Also not likely. So then you would need a random latent change point model. Is that where you're going? Yeah. Yep. You, where, you, where one of the parameters is an individual break. And, but you need a lot of data to be able to pull that off. A lot of, a lot of occasions. Yes. Oh, can you add a random effect to any parameter? <laughs> Uh, yes, data permitting. Okay. I'd say any level one parameter, so any parameter that describes the growth curve, if you have enough data, yes. And so that either depends on the number of occasions to be um, identified in terms of just estimation, but also empirically identified, meaning you have enough information in those occasions to justify or estimate the parameter. Is that the power? Yeah, kind of. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's a question of how precisely you can estimate something and whether that's it's a level of precision that's sufficiently useful for your purposes. But yeah, basically anything you can make random if you can find a way to estimate it. And this is where my husband is on my shoulder going, Bayes, Bayes will do it, Bayes will do it. Mm -hmm. And he's not wrong. But then you have to write out your model in Stan or JAGS or whatever as opposed to just you know pushing a button in LME. So there's pros and cons to everything. But the point of this story is you got to know where the brakes are to use these particular models. Okay? Fair? Fair. All right. Here's another example. Um, this is an example from a study looking at change in cortisol throughout the day. So I've uh, helped a number of people uh, answer these sorts of questions in different research groups. I don't know very much about cortisol, but what I do know is that it spikes 30 minutes after waking up. Am I right? Am I right? I'm the health psychologist today. Woohoo! And then it sort of goes down the rest of the day. But if it doesn't go down very much, that's bad. Like flat slopes, lack of change is a symptom of, I would say, some kind of like high stress slash badness. Is there a better word for it? Dysregulated. Dysregulated. That is a much better word. Thank you. So dysregulation. So given that type of design, people tend to collect cortisol right when people wake up, 30 minutes after they wake up so they can catch that spike, and then a few more times throughout the day. Well, given that expect expectation that the trajectory changes directions, that's a piecewise model. So I would fit potentially one slope that captures the increase from waking up to 30 minutes afterward, and people call that the morning rise, and then another slope or slopes that captures the expected decline across, say, 30 minutes through lunchtime through bedtime. Now, I have this orange line here to sort of make a point. Does it look like this orange line fits these means very well? Can you think of something I could do to it to make it fit better? Square it. Yeah, there's nothing that, that prevents me from fitting a quadratic afternoon decline. So a linear and quadratic slope 
or some other kind of nonlinear slope. So these tend to be called piecewise linear models or linear splines, but that doesn't mean that each slope has to stay linear. And indeed, in your homework about this, it's going to be a three-piece model. Two of the slopes are going to have quadratic pieces to them. Not this homework, but the one after that. This is what the code would look like, by the way, that you would need to be able to create the time variables to do this. You would need to have, as a starting point, four variables in your data set that say when in a given day each person had their observations, because we don't know that everybody wakes up at the same time, and they probably don't. We don't know necessarily that they exactly got their cortisol 30 minutes later, or whether it was 29 minutes or 35 minutes. We don't know when lunch is and when bedtime is. So the way that I would think of this is it's unbalanced time, but what's relevant to time in terms of capturing the changes in cortisol is not necessarily what time the clock says, it's what time it is to you. So if you wake up at 6 a.m., then your cortisol spikes at 6.30. If you wake up at 10 a.m., your cortisol spikes at 10.30. For some of us, lunch is at 11. For some of you, lunch is at 3 o'clock after I finish teaching, right? Or 3.30, whenever it is. And, uh, and uh, bedtime, I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that, that I go to bed uh, at an hour that most of you would laugh at, but I'm old and I'm not ashamed. That's just how, it, it'll happen to you too. It'll happen, just be prepared for it. But point being, we need to know exactly when these occasions were so that we can keep track of exactly how long it's been relative to each person's observation, not just the clock. You might then put in what time people woke up as a person level predictor. So do these shapes look different for people who wake up at six and eat lunch at 11 than people who wake up at 10 and eat lunch at three? It could be that people's schedules and the timing of those have additional impacts that would adjust the shape of this. But within person time is what's important for this. All right. Make sense? OK. Any other examples that come to mind of piecewise models? Is this, this is ringing any bells in terms of the work that folks do? Uh, how about school transitions? Maybe something like the transition from elementary or middle school into high school. Kids that go into a completely different learning environment with different classmates, that could be a break point. Um, folks who track academic achievement across multiple academic years. When kids leave school in May or June, do they start back up in August at the same place that they left off? You think that happens? Eh, it doesn't happen. My kid forgot a bunch of math over the summer. And I looked at his work in August, and I was like, you know how to do this? No, he did know how to do this in June. Uh, the, the idea of forgetting. So piecewise models can be used to insert sort of a deviation between May and August that allows the slope to temporarily fall off the trajectory. So there's, there's ways of hacking these models to get at discrete phenomena that interrupt a growth curve, but otherwise keep the growth curve um, continuous, if that's what's, if that was that what makes sense. So I've used these types of models to help folks analyze a bunch of different intervention type designs, particularly ones that have different periods. So like a baseline period, an intervention period, a follow-up period. That's at least three slopes and potentially two, two jumps and intercept to be able to map all of that. So what it looks like if I were to make an equation, say, of a model for these two slopes, if I just stick with the two linear slopes in the purple and orange, here's what a multi-level model for that would look like. And without even going into the words, does this structure look familiar to you? Yeah, it's not a coincidence. I've got an intercept. I've got two kinds of slopes in this example. Last week, Gesundheit, it was linear and quadratic time. This week, it's slope one and slope two, which I would have defined to represent distinct sections of the growth curve in whatever way makes sense for my problem. If I have three beta placeholders, 
that means I have three level two equations. And if I were to set this up as a structural equation model, I would have how many latent variables? If I have three betas here and three betas here, three. three. I would have three latent variables, one for each beta. If I set it up so that slope one and slope two are both zero at the first occasion, then my intercept would be the expected outcome at the beginning. I could also set it up so that the slopes are zero where they meet at the breaking point. That's another common option, in which case, if I did it that way, the intercept, for instance, would be at the 30 minutes waking time, like where the difference would be. So it would be the highest level of cortisol throughout the day would be your intercept. Uh, you could put time zero at the end and look at individual differences in the ending level. So it's up to you where time zero is still. But there has to be one point at which both of these slopes are coded zero for it to work. In this coding scheme, I've set it up so that the waking occasion is the time zero. So then we have the intercept defined with a fixed part and a random part. The first slope has a fixed part and a random part. The second slope has a fixed part and a random part. So in order to fit this model, I would need four occasions. I would need four to be able to make both pieces random. If I were happy with only one piece being random, then I would only need three. It's n minus two for the number of slopes related to time because the model for the variance would already have had the level one residual that stays there all the time and the level two random intercept. So the n minus two is how many slopes related to change can you have in addition to the intercept and residual variances. And fixed slopes, if I had four occasions, then I have room to add a quadratic piece. So if I had beta 2, slope 2, I could add beta 3, slope 2 squared, for instance. And then I would have n minus 1. That would perfectly capture the four occasions within persons. So here are the example data that we played with before. This is the result of the saturated means model for the six occasions. Last week, we fit a quadratic trend to this. I'm going to try to fit a piecewise trend instead because to me, it looks like this. It looks like there is a distinct rate of change initially than after subsequent practice. So this, I would say, is exploratory. I know, because I'm looking at the picture and going, I think it breaks here. So this is an example of using piecewise models just to approximate nonlinearity not necessarily to make some sort of statement about before versus after. But if I have to come up with names for these things, which is generally good to do, then I would call the orange part an early practice effect and the purple part a later practice effect. And that seems like a, a reasonable thing. And if you look at just my PowerPoint drawing ability, it fits pretty well. So the question is, what do I want my slopes to mean? There's two different ways to set up these sorts of models that I think two different main ways. I would say there's subways within each of those, but there's two of those. And the question is, do you want to know if there is change in each section? Or do you want to know if there is differential change across sections? Which of those is more important to you is going to guide how you set up the model. What you want the model parameters to be directly. But the good news is that whatever you don't get directly is still implied indirectly as a linear combination of the fixed effects and potentially the random effects. So here is a coding scheme on slide 30 that would give you directly the change during each period, each section of time. So I have created a variable that I have called slope one, two. And that name is because slope one, two tracks the change from session one to session two. I have created a second variable in purple that I've called slope two, six, because it tracks the change from two to six. 
So I will tell you right now in your homework over these models, don't use these names. Make up your own names based on the story, because otherwise it'll get confusing. So if I look at how these variables are coded then, here is the original variable for session, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. To represent the change from 1 to 2, I have decided that session 1 is my intercept, so I've set both new predictors to be 0 at session 1. And then I want the first variable to index how much time has passed between 1 and 2, so in this case it's one unit of time, one session, and then it shuts off. It stays at 1. So if all I had in the model were the orange variable, it would predict change that looks like this. Some kind of change from 1 to 2 and then no change afterward. It would essentially group together sessions 2 to 6 as one mean and session 1 as the alternative. This is a dummy code. So it's 2 to 6 versus 1 is what the first one is, is doing. Now why does it stay 1? Because I don't want it to go back down to where it started. I want it to stay where it left off. So if I had coded this 0, 1, 2, the rest of these would stay at 2 because I left off at 2. So then purple. Purple's job is to pick up where orange left off. So it stays at zero because purple's not active yet. Purple kicks in after session two. And so then purple indexes how much time has passed relative to session two as the knot or the breakpoint. And its job is to track how much change there is in the second part of the trajectory. Yes? Are these linear combinations? These are two different linear slopes that are working together and their interpretation when they're together is that slope 1, 2 directly tracks the change from 1 to 2, whereas slope 2, 6 directly tracks the change from 2 to 6. In reference to 1 and uh, the, uh, the point at session 2, right? So yes, from 2 oh. to 6. So if, if orange was not in the model and all you had was purple, then you'd be lumping together sessions one and two and pitting and then pitting them. So think about this from the perspective of unique effects and regression, right? Each slope contributes to the prediction its unique variance that the other predictors don't have. So purple becomes uniquely two to six because it's controlling for orange, which does the part from one to two. Orange becomes directly 1 to 2 after controlling for purple, which does the rest of it. So they're dividing up the, the six means into two sections that each is responsible for its own section. So I call this two direct slopes because it directly tells you, is there change during each section? Did they improve from 1 to 2? And then did they improve from 2 to 6? where 1 to 2 would be just a difference because there's only one, one change there, whereas 2 to 6 is a rate of improvement across those five sessions. Yeah. So if, let's say, for whatever reason, at session 4 I went back up, then you'd have another color, another, another row and another color, and then the purple would go up to 4 and then repeat 4 multiple times. Yes, okay. um, let me let me make a, a picture of that. One second. So if I had, let's do it down because this is what it would look like in a data file instead. So we had slope one, two, slope two, six, and by the way, whenever I have to code piecewise models, this is where I start. I always make a table first to figure out like what it should look like, and then I write the code that makes the table. And those of you who had me for intermediate or 6242, I made you do this already. 
It was for, we did this with education data where we looked at the change in income from people who hadn't graduated high school, to graduated high school, who had graduated college. And then I made you do something like this in a homework as well. So this is not brand new for some of you. So if we had, first step, where do you want your intercept? So some place has to be zeroed out as the intercept. It's up to you where that is. So past session one, how much time has passed? One unit in time. So if I wanted to shut off there, I have it like that. I'll put the original variable up here and the original values right here. So here, I want it to pick up after session two and tell me how much time has passed. Now what if we keep going, something like this, and I have an expectation that after session five, let's say it changes, changes direction, like you said. So maybe I've introduced something, taken it away, brought it back. So I want three pieces. So I would code that like this. The next one would be uh, five to nine, we'll call it that. So if I want it to shut off after session five, what goes here? Three. Threes. Threes. Okay. So then if I just had this much, this model says change here, change here, and then the model predicts constancy afterwards. So now I need another one to step in. What goes here? Zero. Zero. What goes here? Zero. If I wanted to start at five? Yeah, after five, basically, from that point forward. So now, what goes here? One. 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 Yeah, how much time has passed since session five? Two. Like Zero. that. So now, this is here. This is here. And that's that. Be three pieces. Like a baton, like a baton ah, kind of. That person just stays at that. Yeah. The, off point. It's a parameter relay race. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And when it's not your turn to run, you stay where you left. You were left off, right? <laughs> and what happens if you go out of your zone? You're out of the race. You're disqualified. So something like this would be three different slopes to track each different section of time. And so if I wanted to test, is this rate of change different than that rate of change is different than that rate of change, then what do I need to do? Um, linear contrast? Linear contrast, yeah. The model's going to give me this slope and whether it's significant. Did they change during this period? Did they change during this period? Did they change during this period? If I want to know if they changed differently, then I would have to subtract one slope from another. And that would be a linear combination type thing that would look like this. For instance, one like that. Another would be like that. So the first one would say, did they change differently between here and here? The second contrast would say, did they change differently between here and here? Uh, this would just, this would be literally the difference between the two slope coefficients okay. and you would ask for a standard error to go with it to form a hypothesis test. Now, why do I have zeros in both of the first spots here? Intercept. intercept, yes. Intercept is not part of the story of how the slopes changed. What if I had a hypothesis that they should change differently here than here? How do I do that? One, zero, one. Zero. One. Yep, just like that. What if I wanted to do something like I think the average of these two is different than that one. Could I do that? Mm -hmm. Sure I could. Zero. Minus one. Uh, I'm going to do this. Okay. 
like that. Or, yeah, two minuses. Yep, there we go. So then it's lumping, the 2.5s are lumping these two together, creating an average slope for the two and contrasting it with the last one. I was going to get the slope in time over two. Yep. Yep, so that it still has to, to sum to zero. And if you wanted to do like three, then you're like in the, this, this yeah. sort of place. But I think that in R it actually lets you do this directly to put the fraction in for the denominator. I think it should. Um, in SAS, there's an option called divisor that allows you to do, do it this way where you put in the denominator. So point being, this method of coding directly tells you, did they change during each section? If you want to know about differences in change, then you have to ask for comparisons of the slopes as a separate statement, but it will tell you that answer still. Okay, does that help? And yes, these tables, very important. Um, how would all of this change? If I decided that I wanted to make session five my knot point, my, my zero, or not my knot point, my uh, intercept. One, zero, zero. Yep, so I want session five to be zero now. That's my intercept. Negative numbers for Yeah, negative floating. numbers. I got to go backwards. So this one's not awake yet. So then this would be, let's see, relative. Now this is the part where I'm like, why did I do this in front of you all? Minus four? Yeah, so it, it'd be negative. How much further away is one than five? Mm -hmm. Like that, I think. Mm -hmm. No, that's not right. Hang on. No, yeah, it's, no, it's relative to five. Yeah, I got to, my bad. Minus two? No. I can't do it in front of you. This is why this is hard. But point being, it would have to be, if you zeroed this out, then everything else would be logically uh, negative numbers, positive numbers before and after that point. So. But, for example, in a slope 1, one 2, mm -hmm. after that 0, session 6 would be 1, right? Just 1, 1, 1, 1. Well, so this one is only yeah. during this part. So it would have to, if this is, I'm sorry guys, I can't do this off the top of my head. I, I, need, I need to work this out and, and double check it. This is why I have everything prepared ahead of time. It's hard. But I know that these would be positive numbers and these would be negative numbers. I know that much. So. Didn't you just, I mean, if you, just, if you had a data set yeah. that treated um, one as the intercept yeah. or whatever, then you just expect like, Five from all the values. And yeah. Was, okay. yeah, you can always you can always recenter time, but getting the centering and the chunks that are active correct at the same time is the tricky part. Okay. Um, in chapter six, the second part of chapter six, I have a couple three piece examples and then I have like some equations that are more general to figure out how you would do this based on centering at different points as to where the time zero is. But there is a reason why I typically like to put it at the beginning. It's the easiest one to do on the fly. What would be the reason for centering at five? So, so the reason for centering at any point is because eventually your intercept is going to be to represent individual differences in the y-axis at that point mm -hmm. as one type of individual difference to be predicted. So like if I left it like this, then I would be predicting why do some people start out differently than others as one type of prediction and then why do they change differently? If I moved it to five, it would be why are they at different point? Why are they different at that point? Like why are some people different right after the intervention finishes or something? Like wherever five is, and if you care about that point as a way to, to predict individual differences. Okay. So did you have a question? Yeah. No, I saw, thought I saw a hand. A yes. comment because you had an example in intermediate. So you fix the intercept with zero. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, give me that for a second. <laughs> you use negative. See, I knew I could do it. I did it once before. I can prove it, yes. It is from intermediate. Yeah, you can do that. That's class. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm not crazy. I'm just a little overwhelmed. <laughs>
Um, but yes, I can, uh, I will, in the intermediate class, um, I have an example, lecture three, that one is, I think, four? Uh, yes, three. It's three in that yeah. class, yeah. So there's more examples of that one, too. I'll pull that up. Um, yeah, I'll pull that up now. Question? Yeah, I was just... No, I have... See, this is the other reason why I keep everything that I do online, so that I can find it when I need to and send it to people. So, in... Lecture 3, slide yeah. 33. Lecture 3, slide 33 of this class, which is blue, all my classes are color coded so that when I look at the web page, I know what I'm talking about. I've classically conditioned myself in that regard. Also keeps me from posting the videos to the right place, you know. Yes, so this one, slide 33? Yep. Yep, okay, let me pull that up. Thank you. Yeah, let, let this be a lesson that um, even people who've been teaching for 16 years sometimes get overwhelmed and can't think. <laughs> I'm in one of those moments right now. But I have things that I've done before correctly to save me, so huzzah. All right, so this example was based on the idea of change in income as the outcome variable, so how much money you make as a function of years of education. So these are the means for this sample of how much money they make in thousands of dollars as a function of how many years of education. And if I just look at this picture, it looked like if you don't graduate high school, then having more education doesn't really help you. It's like basically it's flat from sixth grade up to 11th grade. And if you did graduate high school, then there's a bump. The people who have 12th grade as noticeably higher than 11th grade, about $4,000. And then after that, it goes up, although it's questionable what the functional form is, it probably is related to degrees. So if you have a bachelor's degree and then you only do one year of graduate school, then that doesn't get you very far. But if you have a master's degree after two years, then that gets you another bump in pay. And then after that, you know, if you keep going past your master's, too bad for you. You're going to go back down. <laughs> None of us are here for the money, right? We're here for the love of the game. But to set up this type of three-piece expectation, I put grade 11 as my intercept. So I zeroed that out. And then relative to grade 11, the first slope that covers people with less than high school, it goes backwards. So grade 10 is minus 1, grade 9 is minus 2, all the way down to grade 6 or wherever it last leaves off. The middle one is actually, you could call it either a slope or a jump because it only spans 11 to 12. So it's just a jump, a shift and in intercept between 11 and 12 that shuts off. And then after that, the last slope says, what is the advantage among people who graduated high school of continuing their education past 12? So there you go. There's an example with the intercept in the middle. What if it staggers? Well, that's not in some of the lesson plans. So that, what if it staggers? Staggers. How do you say that? Um, and, and they don't, like, the people don't, um, it shuts off at different times. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't do that in this framework. Okay. If it needs to shut off differently at different times for different people, then that is a random latent change point kind of thing. This is just straight up years of education, not even degrees. Because as we all know, there's not exactly like everyone finishes their master's degree in two years and everyone finishes their bachelor's degree in four years or whatever. That doesn't hold. These are old data. So. Staggered? 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 Oh. Is that not how you say that word? Staggered. Staggered? No, that's my northern A. Okay. So my, I have a Midwestern <laughs> accent that is partly northern and partly not yet. So I say, okay. like, I say things like pancake, and it sounds like pain cake, but it's just pancake to me. Or aches axis, like, I just, it goes northern sometimes. So staggered, like bagel. Yeah. It, it, it's just how I talk. I'm sorry. No, no, I yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. Hey, at least I didn't say roof yet. I didn't break out that one. Up on the roof. That sounds completely fine to me. Anyway, 
uh, lots of different types of, of situations in which piecewise models can be useful, not just for time, but for any quantitative predictor. So that's why I had introduced it in this class, just in thinking about if the slope is not linear, what are some other choices? So other situations in which something like this might be useful, um, if you're working with a clinical measure, let's say that you're working with, um, can I be a health psychologist still? Can you give me like um, like a depression measure that has a cutoff? Okay, what's the number? You can make it up. I'm not going to know the difference. Okay, so if I t if I have a CESD, is that it? So if I have a depression inventory, and if I score at least a 12, then I'm I have a problem. What was there wording that goes with that? Uh, clinical, depression. clinical depression. So you could potentially fit a slope to look at what is the effect of being higher in depression among people who are subclinical, so between 0 and 15 or 12, whatever the cutoff is, and among people who are at clinical levels. So is there a bigger impact of depression if you have a lot of it than if you have not a lot of it? So for anything where there's some number where something is supposed to be qualitatively different, you can actually test different slopes with more adapter to see if that would be useful. This one is much easier. Now you see why I started with two. Uh, yeah, I'll show you the other one, and we'll get into the example next time, I think. So this one has the advantage of directly tracking the rate of change during each section of the growth curve. It has the disadvantage of not allowing you to directly test differences in slopes, but you can get those as linear combinations of the slopes that you do have. Here's an alternative. I call this one slope and deviation slope. The purple predictor is exactly the same. It's slope 2.6 again. What has changed on slide 31 here is the orange one. And I called it slope 1-6 because it's tracking the change from session 1 to 6. And I called this same predictor last week time. It is the same. Now, it looks like this might be redundant to some extent, right? Because neither of them shut off. The orange one operates the whole way through. Purple kicks in after session 2. But this coding scheme will give you, when they're both together, orange is still going to be just the first part, the change from 1 to 2, because after that point it has to compete with purple. And purple steps in to tell you how different the second slope is from the first slope. Isn't this a random effect? Nope, it's not random. These are fixed. Okay. So for this type of trajectory, there are three things you might want to know about change. Do they change in the first part? Do they change in the second part? Do they change differently in the second relative to the first? Any one model gives you two of those directly and you get the third as a linear combination. The previous coding scheme gave you each slope directly. This coding scheme gives you the orange slope directly and then purple is the difference. So what happens after sessions two that is unique? That's what purple is indexing. And if the slopes were exactly the same, then purple would have nothing to do. And the coefficient that goes with purple slope two six would be zero. So this parameterization directly allows you to test. Do you even need two slopes or is one linear slope good enough? Purple is the slope difference after the not point. Another situation in which this would be useful, besides just wanting to know the difference, is in growth contexts in which people were going to change without you. So if you think about achievement in children, if I'm going into a school and I want to try my new treatment program to make division easier, that's what my child is working on right now, is learning how to do division, and apparently it's tricky. If I want to improve his ability to learn division and I have a new way of teaching him, 
then I would have maybe a treatment group that gets my new way of teaching division relative to a control group that does whatever they were doing before. Now, if school is useful, they should all improve over time, right? Assuming that what they were doing before is at least useful enough, the kids all grow. So if I want to know the effect of my intervention, I don't want to know if they grow at all. I want to know if they grow more than they would have. Let me draw. Where is paint? Do I have paint? I have paint on here. It disappeared. Oh no. I can't draw without paint. Here's paint 3D. Ooh. Fancy. Nathan, I'm old. <laughs> I'm not going to get a, a, a jam board. But I am going to draw on paint because I'm that old. This was the first computer program I learned how to use, actually, when I was about seven years old. Instead of learning division, I learned how to do this. And it's still fun. So let's say that my y-axis here is division, where more is good. Here's time. So the kids that don't get into my special intervention, they're learning division. The intervention starts. They keep on learning, do to do. The kids that do get my nifty intervention, because I've randomly assigned them, they should be about the same. And then my beautiful intervention should put them onto a different trajectory. So I don't want to know if this trajectory is different than zero. Nope. I want to know this difference. Is this trajectory different than that trajectory? And the coding scheme that I just showed you allows me to do that. So if I want to know if there's different change after a certain point than there was before, this is how I would set it up. Is that a one-tailed test? Not one-tailed. Okay. No, one-tailed one -tailed tests are bullshit and we don't do those here. Okay. Yeah. If you have an expectation and you can conceivably be wrong, it's two-tailed as far as I'm concerned. But this is just rearranging the same information. It's a, so what you would get directly is what is the effect of change from one to two, because that's what orange provides uniquely. And then what is the difference in the slope after session two, because that's what purple gives you. And to get to what the slope actually would be, it's orange plus purple as the slope for the second part. Let me show you a picture. Maybe? I don't have a picture in here. Nope. I guess you're going to have to wait for Thursday to see the picture because it's in the example. But it works out that these models are equivalent. They're just rearrangements of each other. It's a question of what kind of random effects do you want to have? Do you want to have random effects in the amount of change that happens in each piece? Because I would set it up this way with direct slopes. Or do you want to have random effects in differences in change after intervention? I would set it up this way if that's what you want. Kind of, but not really. It's the same idea because it's a difference in slopes, but it's, a mo it's on one metric, not across a moderator. So going back to the picture here then, if there is no effect of an intervention, then everybody should be on the same trajectory before and after. So I don't want to know if this slope is significant because it's supposed to be because it was going to be anyway. I want to know if my difference in slope is significant, if they grew more afterwards than before. That's the deviation slope model instead. Let me get to my picture. 
Okay, here's what the answer is going to be. This is the picture I was looking for. So if I set this up directly, it works out that the intercept for this model is estimated at 1962, which is the expected value at session one. The first slope is minus 164, so they improve on average from sessions one to two by 164 milliseconds. After session two, they improve by 33 milliseconds a session instead. So the rate of change is, looks like it's lower after session two. So if I set up the deviation slope model instead, code, code, numbers, 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 then what I get directly is slope 2.6 carries the difference in slope. The slope after session 2 is less negative by 131 milliseconds. So the two different solutions give you two different versions of the same story. They both tell you, given my coding scheme, what the change was initially. You can either get what is the change after that or what is the difference in change after that. And you can get to the missing one as a linear combination. But we'll save all of that fun for next time. All right. So Thursday, then, we will be back in here. We'll finish this, and maybe we'll finish it. We'll see how far we get. And I'm kind of waiting to see how, how long this takes as to what's coming next. My intent, though, is probably not to spend class time on example C, because that's only using SAS and Levon. I'll probably make a video for that one. But to, to do example D after this, which is a way to use linear models to approximate exponential change. All right. Any last-minute questions before we call it a day? All right, then. Thanks for being here. I hope to see you again on Thursday. Let me know if you need anything.